you know what the funny thing about this, David, is I didn't realize that I was a good community builder until I had built two different communities to over 200,000 members. I recognized that there was other business models exactly like mine, just different genres. Recently, you and I and uh, an all-star cast were in Montana. We did that. We did that great gig with the, uh, the ultimate backdrop, right? you know, Whitefish Lake, you know, like the ultimate backdrop, mountains and the whole deal. And we talked about, you know, so we, so we had you and we had, we had Nicole Johnson, who's with, been within, within Yankees uh, in terms of mental performance. We had Cynthia Thurlow, who's like a, a TEDx speaker, you know, like knows all about nutrition and health and all of that. Alex Stern, constant contact, the rock star, just has done tons of exits, very successful exits. Um, and Lauren Jeff Johnson, by the way, what's that? Lauren Johnson. You said Nicole. So I'm not who knew. Oh, this was Nicole. 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 No, Nicole is her middle name. And she actually has, she has Lauren Johnson on, on some of her social things and Lauren Nicole Johnson on others. And then obviously Jeff Lerner, who is doing really crushing it in the space of educating entrepreneurs and who, Roger Wakefield. Yeah, Roger, like the old, like the, he's the rock star on YouTube with the, as a plumber. I love it. He goes, Hi, I'm Roger Wakefield, and I'm just a plumber. I'm like, yeah, you're you're just a plumber, like uh, like Bono is just a singer, and like the Beatles were just a band. I mean, give me a break. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no, no real plumber just has that that the uh, the mustache thing going. Oh on. yeah, he's got, he's, he's got the great, you know, he's he's a class act all the way. And I'm, then, I'm pretty sure that he's got a talent agent that just does his his mustache for him. I'm, I'm he's got to have like someone on a staff that's like the mustache person. Like Gary V has what? Gary has 25 people handling his social media. I think. I think Roger probably has, he didn't tell us, he probably had three people in his room who are just responsible for grooming his mustache. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Travel with him everywhere. <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, Mustache envy, that's all. Ex completely. And then you, and then you are like, you're, you're the master com like community builder. And that, that's where I see you as, actually. And, and you touched upon it. You scratched the surface. And mm -hmm. I knew that I had questions. And I thought, if I have questions, I think others will have questions. So that's why I said, you know, why don't we jump on this call and let's just dig a little deeper. And so just to, to frame it, you know, for those that don't know, I mean, you built, you built a community previously and then you just jump ship and I'm going to let you go into the specifics, but then you jump ship and you, you flip that and then started brand new creating this entrepreneurial community, which is expanding and thriving. And I just think you're, I think you're just so on the bead. You are really great at building the community, giving the community reason to stay engaged, giving the community the reason to come, keep coming back and adding value, adding value, adding value. And I think you do it brilliantly, but to me, you're kind of like, you're kind of like the guy in the corner, like you go, you're not, you're not circling the room very much, but it's like, but I want to know. He, he does a lot. He, he's, he's over there. He's in the corner. He's, he's kind of cool. He, you know, he's not, he's not like going around shaking everyone's hand, but if I know if I go over to him and I speak to him, I'm going to like walk away smarter, more informed, and he's going to have stories to tell. So that's what I wanted to dig in a little bit, because I think that you have secrets, probably things that you consider normal. Like there are things that I do that I consider normal. It's just because that's my sweet spot. And I think that you similarly have a sweet spot for this community building component that you might just take for granted. And I wanted to just dig a little bit and, and sort of unveil those, unwrap those a bit. So why don't, you, why don't you just kind of give for those people who are newly discovering you, who may not, been, may not know your story, how first sort of automotive centric uh, community you built, what happened, and then this one. Yeah, you know what the funny thing about this, David, is I didn't realize that I was a good community builder until I had built two community. <laughs> two different communities to over 200,000 members. And the thing that was is that when I was in the, the trenches, so to speak, of building those communities, I recognized that there was other business models exactly like mine, just different genres. So for context, I built the largest General Motors performance community on the internet. It's still the number one, even after 20 years. And I sold that in 2007, and then I built a truck empire that grew to 280,000. The first one was over 300,000. Next one, it grew to 280,000. And so I did it in two different classes, two different, yeah. completely different groups. And just to give, just to give context. So 
Over, how long did it take you to build the first one? How long did it take you to build the second one? Okay. First one, we achieved the first 100,000 members probably by the end of year two. Mm. Incredible. Yeah. And, and so me being in that space, the, the automotive community, the forum groups, those things like that, I started to look around and there's, you know, there's 50 other sites that are equally big. So you just kind of think like you're, you're, you're just like them, you know, and we were admittedly one of the bigger ones, obviously, of all of them. But when you see other people doing it at the same level, you kind of just don't give yourself a whole lot of credit, right? And then when you start to step out in the real world where people aren't building 100,000 plus communities, you realize like, okay, that was a unique uh, skill set or a unique methodology that I had to employ to be able to do that. And then it was really like 10 years later, dude, that I started to realize like, I don't see many people doing this very well. I mean, see a lot of people trying. You know, when Facebook rolled out groups, everybody wouldn't create a Facebook group, everyone. And most of them made it to maybe a hundred members and they just really lost momentum, lost steam. And they go, hey, I guess this isn't for me. I'm gonna go back to the feed. You know, or I'm gonna switch platforms. And I built those communities. And you know, the one I got right now is about 4,000 entrepreneurs, but I really built this one passively rather than aggressively. The other ways I built was very aggressive. You know, we got in with the media, we got in with magazines and events and different things and really try to do some giveaways and grow things like without, I wouldn't say organically because we were actually spending other people's money to grow those, those communities. But with the entrepreneurship thing, I was like, you know what, this is gonna be a lifetime thing for me. So I'm not in a hurry just to get the big numbers just for the vanity metrics, but I wanna have to make sure that the community that I'm building is very strong and it's full of good people because I do participate in other communities on Facebook and LinkedIn and such where they may have a hundred thousand members looks good on paper, but then you got people talking trash at each other and even berating the people that own the communities and they're allowing that. I'm like, wow, you know, I'd rather have a hundred people that were committed and actually good people than a million people that were talking trash to me. You yeah. Know? yeah. So you did the first group, did the first group grew, grew it really fast. The second group you grew to 200 and what? 280. 280 over what, over what window of time? Probably about a year and a half. That's like over, that's a quarter of a million over a year. That's, that's wild. So I'm assuming you took what you learned in the first group and you to, to really, because that seems like hyper growth to me. That seems really fast. Yeah, absolutely. But when, when you own the website and you have access to the server logs, you can see the activity. You can see who's logging in with an actual account and you can see who, what we would call as lurkers. So for a context of today's frame, that would be maybe the unique IP addresses that visit your website on a daily basis. You can monitor that if you put the right you know, apps in place to do that. Maybe have Google Analytics in the background monitoring that for you so you can see unique visits per day. But if you have some kind of a way for people to log into their actual accounts, you can also see how many do that per day. And you can just do the math and you go realize that Early on, we realized that, okay, well, only about 50% of the people that visit our website, because it was free to be able to view it, you mm -hmm. can get all the privileges of, be, of being a, a user, a content consumer, rather than having to log in. Because a lot of people, even back then, didn't like giving their email addresses out and stuff like that. So we said, okay, damn it. In order for us to be able to attract more advertising revenue, we need to prove that we have more eyeballs logging in with actual accounts. So how do we get those people that are lurking to sign up? And I said, well, what would I, what would it take for me to sign up? You know, we, we hear about lead magnets and all those kind of things nowadays. Like we created that 20 years ago. This was not something new that people are like, oh my God, it's a funnel and it's lead magnet and it's going to go to the, the, it's like, dude, we've been doing this for 20 years. This is like not new term, you know, terminology is different, but we, the methodology is not, the, it's not different at all. Hmm. So I said, okay, what is going to get me off of this keyboard to be able to log in and said, well, what if we did giveaways? You know, what if we find some gift certificates or just something of good value that people may win if they, if they're a member and only members can win, maybe we could do that. So that was the first idea. So we said, okay, we initially started buying gift certificates. We would have sponsors on the website already that maybe at that point we had 50 advertisers and we said, Hey, I'm going to go buy one from this shop and we'll give it away. And we did that for a few months. It was working pretty good. And I was like, you know what, why are we paying for this? Like that sponsor's getting the business, they're getting the, the notoriety. So, so the next you know, logical step is like, hey, what if they just donate that gift certificate to us? They become a featured sponsor for that month. 
Mm -hmm. And the potential winner, we had two different winners. We usually had the winners of all of the membership. So if you're signed up, like you could always win. And then we had the ones that just signed up for that month. So that that's really enticing to get people to sign up for that month. So they get two chances to win now. And I would just go to the shop and I said, Hey, can you donate a $500 gift certificate? We'll have you as a featured sponsor. They'll have to spend it with you when they win it, but you'll get a customer out of it. You'll get recognition. The other person wins an opportunity. We win by having more membership enrollment. And we did that. And soon enough, a few months into that, people started and the other sponsors started to see these featured sponsor things and they're given giveaways. And they're like, well, hey, how would you get involved in that? There's, there's more month, you know, there's more sponsors than months. So I said, okay, well, what if you just give us more money? So that was your tool to start ramping up the growth. Yeah. But growth is growth is one part. Retention is the other part. Mm-hmm. I mean, what I see, you know, cause I'm, cause I'm part of the 365, you know, 365 driven, you know, community. And I see you're engaged, you're providing value insights, narrative, different things. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like you've, you, it's very interesting to see. I mean, it's kind of like you've become like a family member. It's like, oh, that's what Tony's doing now, right? And so I, so I mean, the ramping up is the one part, but then you're keeping people engaged. So I mean, I see what you're doing in 365, which I'm very, I want to delve into, but on, on the, what did you do content wise to keep on the, on the automotive, on the, on that side, what, what type of, did you find that there was a certain type of content or, or just a certain variety of content. What did you What did you do to keep people keep going? Oh, I, I like coming here. I keep coming back here. What was What did that look like? In that days, we basically were starting the the early phases of moving out of the print media down to the digital media. So, a lot of the magazines, unfortunately, that we all know and, and loved back then, are out of business nowadays. In all in all niches, not just automotive, because they weren't able to pivot their notoriety, their branding into the digital space. The ones that did, did really well. They've done it really exceptionally well, but you find a lot of them were thought they were just too big to fail because they had a lot of circulation, a lot of subscriptions and websites like mine where information was on the point to the date. You didn't have to have a 30 day waiting time from the time that something was hot or new oh, so when it was, it was top- released. So it was topical. Yeah. It was, it was speedy speed of delivery. So when you think about this, if let's say like you're a parts manufacturer or even an automotive manufacturer and you go, Hey, we got this new part that we just developed. We released it. We're ready to sell it. Well, they go to that news to the media, the print media, and they go, okay, we'll get you in two months from now. We're getting that, that issue. Cause we're already done with this issue. So we got to start planning two months from now to make that issue. So you had to wait 60 days for your hot item that you wanted to start selling right away to be printed. And they could go to my website and actually log in with a user account that's really representing their brand, announce it that day and start making sales that day, like literally minutes after they made the post. Mm. So it wasn't really too much hard of a you know logic there to understand that, wow, these digital guys charge us less because back then a, a full page ad in a magazine was about eight to $10,000. Mm. And we were charging initially about 150 a month. And so- no brainer. Think about it. It was like a no brainer. We got it fast. We get, we can actually interact with people back and forth and they can give us comments and they can give us you know negative and positive comments about the things we're, we're creating. And we can roll that back into the R and D and go f- make a better product. And we can have people that are testing it as a user and giving us real feedback and sharing the results. So the digital space was just way better at just getting information out there at a quicker pace. And that's why print media just was just lagging behind. They just, you know, they were, they were really limited by their technology. So it's, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's how it is. No, no, I, no, I think, I think that's very astute of your part to recognize, you know, I'm all about branding. And so one of the things I talk about is, is isolating, finding, dialing in and isolating the things that are hiding in plain sight. And I think that that's what you did. You found immediacy. Immediacy was this thing hiding in plain sight. You could deliver on immediacy that no print medium could. That is brilliant. That's actually very smart, very astute, very simple, but very brilliant. And so I love that. So how did you then, how did you then take with what you saw and what you learned and built with those prior communities into 365? Now, 365 Driven, you started when? May of 2017. May of 2017. So you're, so you're, you're going, you're going like more of a, a very, very gradual growth on that one. Yeah. But 
but it, from from what I'm seeing, I mean, it's, it seems that there's lots of engagement. Seems like there's a really strong. It seems like a very strong. Like people are engaged, they're coming back, etc. Um, what what lessons are you applying? What are you doing? Because you jumped into a brand new space. It was not automotive. It was bang entrepreneurs, right? And there's no shortage of entrepreneurial communities and you know startup communities and different communities geared toward business. What what did you? What was your way of going in there and making your dent, making your mark? There's a lot of takeaways that I learned from managing those large communities is that one, you have to, you have to remove the cancer from your organization. You have to remove the cancer from your membership. And I see a lot of people fail at this in a big way because they don't have a thick enough skin or they're just really trying to avoid those confrontational conversations or negative things. And they just let these negative people who attack other people in their group or just talk trash or just troll. They, they allow that to go on because they just want to make sure they have the membership to make it look good on the vanity metrics. But for me as a community leader, I'm not looking for followers. I'm looking for actual community people that will interact with each other, become lifelong friends. I've been a part of marriages and divorces and all kinds of things because of the communities I've built and I build lifelong friends. And that's the thing is that as a community member, I, I want everybody that's in my community to, be, to become best friends. I mm -hmm. want them all to become best friends. And how do I do that as well? I facilitate conversations that get them to engage, but they will not engage if there's a bunch of negative people and people talking trash and trolling them with every response, because I've seen some really good ideas for communities just get ruined by not even a lot of people, probably three or four people that are just like these jerks that always step all in things. and make fun of stuff or they, they put the little laughy smiley thing on people making fun of their stuff or they they say things like why would you ask that in here like you should use google like that's a rookie question you know like people allow that in their groups what happens is the people who do like to contribute and do like to participate will hang out in the back rafters and just watch because they're not going to engage because why wouldn't just you made a million dollar business why would you want some jackass trying to respond to you and trolling you when you don't even have to respond so you, you got to be good at identifying those people quickly, doing a little corrective action. You always want to reprimand sometimes in public, but always try to do it privately first to give them a chance. Say, hey, that's not really a, something we allow in this group. If you do it again, we're just going to remove you. And I don't care who it is, dude. It could be my mother and I would still remove her. It could be your best friend. I would still remove them. So yeah. Yeah. you don't have to have a tolerance for that. And when you allow that, you basically crush the culture. There's there's nothing left with your your, your community because they're like, this isn't a safe place to hang out. I don't want to participate because these jackasses are going to say negative things and troll me. So why am I here again, right? And even in a car thing, you can imagine 200 plus thousand, 300 plus thousand car guys that like to race. You know, there's some egos and you know alpha <laughs> stuff and all these things. And like, that was a proving grounds. Like if you can manage a group that size and also have the right staff in place that keep their eyes balls and all these different forums that are in that forum and understand that, Hey, we don't allow these things. And here's, here's the things to look for. And they would just ban these people. It's like, Hey, we don't, we don't, if they're going to show their ass that bad, just ban them. We, they don't need to be here. We don't want them here. And by doing that, that creates the engagement that creates the content creation that, that gets them more involved. It makes more, it's more enjoyable, first of all, just to browse through and see not people just talking trash to each other. And so you take that into an entrepreneurship group. And the best way to do that is to start with a small group. I started with 30 people in the group. I, I was literally went on my timeline and I said, Hey guys, I'm writing a book about entrepreneurship. I don't know how many of you are entrepreneurs are interested in joining a group, but I'm going to build a small group of entrepreneurs. We're going to talk about topics around business ownership and scaling and, and maybe even exiting if you're into that. And I was thinking it's going to be like 10 people sign up, but I had about 30 people from just my Facebook timeline back then may have been 1500 total friends at the time. And they said, Hey, that sounds interesting. Uh, you know, I'm not a business owner yet, or I want, you know, they're all different levels. You know, somebody like built seven and eight figure companies like, yeah, cool. I'll, I'll hang out and do that. So I started with a small group, 30 people, and that's how you establish the culture. Because when you have a small group, it's a lot easier to manage. Here's what we're going to do in this group. Here's what we're not going to allow in this group. You're not going to spam this group. You're not going to do this. We're not going to get people to sign up for your, your lead magnets in here. You're not going to just post these stupid motivational quotes that have no context or meaning behind them. Like we want legit entrepreneurship discussions, the good and the bad, not just all rah, 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 let's win. It's, we don't want that. We want the real deal. Like if you're going through things, you need help, you need some guidance from people, post it up and we're going to give you the results. So that's 
easy to establish when you have a small group and it's easy to pick out the negative apples and kick them out sooner. And I, I see that there was some people early on that I had to kick out. They were, they start out initially good, but you could tell they're kind of like the closet hater. You know, they're just in there just to see what you're doing to see if they can take something from that. And, you know, starting as, as soon as something like they start to disagree, you start to these people, I call them, you know, the, they're, they're just always, they always have a, a contrarian view, you know, they're contrarian. So anytime someone posts, they got a negative thing to say about it. And you see this on your LinkedIn as well. Like you post, there's always the same people that are like, well, I don't know, David, if the sky is blue, technically it's, you know, it's like, dude, that's, you're not even, you're going off topic of what the meaning was about. like. I just said sky in my sentence and you're talking about contradictions here. So you got to get rid of those people because they're never going to serve the community. They're never going to create any value. They're just going to be there to just naysay things. So you see the human dynamics. There's a lot of human dynamics and human psychology that's required to build a community like that. For me, it's a big, it's a big takeaway is you're not just forming a group. You're forming a group while at the same time going, okay, Yes, I'm going to be your host. Yes, I'm going to be the bouncer. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be a guy at the front door who says, uh, no, you're underage or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. you know? True. It's true. All you true. Know? And so I see, I mean, that that's, and that to me is the difference. You're not, I think a lot of what I see is there's a lot who are like, you know, the, they're always in the spotlight and all this kind of stuff. And to me, you're spotlighting this, area of interest. And I think that that's probably is the most noticeable difference. You're spotlighting this area of interest and creating a forum for that to be the topic of interest. Mm -hmm. And you happen to be the person initiating it. Whereas some others will be like, Hey, blah, 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 me and blah, 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 me. And da, 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 me, you know, it's like, wait a second, yeah. you know, there's not enough oxygen in the room for that kind of treatment. So um, no, I, I love that. And now, and so for, and for those that don't know, I mean, so, you know, so Tony and I, we, we were introduced by, a, by a mutual acquaintance who said, oh, you got it. Tony, you got to interview David. He's like really good. Da, 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 da. So Tony and Tony gets a lot of these pitches because of his podcast. Then he, you know, we kind of just exchange he, the, the chemistry felt good. Da, 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 da. We had a really, I, I loved, I loved the podcast because to me, Tony is very down to earth, you know? It's like, if, if, if you don't know, I've heard, I, I think I heard one person say, you know, Tony's kind of, he's kind of like, he's kind of like sort of, sort of serious and quiet. I said, serious or quiet. I said, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't hang out with him, if, if you spend maybe one minute with him, he is, but if you actually just to hang out and did it, he's, you know, he's right in there. He's like, you know, boom, boom, he'll, he'll give and take and punch and throw and just will out prank each other and do all that kind of stuff. And then that grew to you do, having this recent gig in Montana, which was awesome. And for those that didn't know about it, so it was it was great. We I know you had to limit it to forty entrepreneurs. It was a very small, intimate venue, um, thirty two or thirty four. I think it was thirty four. I actually ultimately ended up attending because I know there were some last minute arrivals. Right. So thirty four were there. We had a great time, a great venue. I didn't know your criteria, so I was and I didn't know any of the speakers, other than you. So I was I was coming to meet them and hang out with them and break bread with them, you know, like, um, and so it was just interesting to know. And they all had a different chemistry, uh, a different level of how many years they've been in experience and, and different places. But when I stepped back, I said, well, you know, there's about, there's roughly probably about between eight to $10 billion worth of street smarts in this, in this lineup, eight to eight to 10 billion dollars worth of actual intelligence here that people could tap into and but it was tapped into in a very organic intimate way and even with that one night that we started the first I think I guess it was Saturday night where everybody got a chance to meet and we all sat down and it was kind of like like a campfire you know chat you yeah know? in front and, of a fireplace yeah it's a hats off to you because you created the context for something like that to happen I don't know that that could have happened under someone, someone else, you know, it's a very different, very, very different kind of venue. Yeah. The speakers, there's a good strategy behind that. So, you know, thank you for recognizing that, but you know, they're all high performers. Everyone that was on that stage was exceptional at what they do. And I have a little bit of a cheat sheet behind that because as a podcast host, I also know which episodes get downloaded the most. Mm. 
So that's a starting base. So I could find, I could easily pull the top 20 episodes and see like, why were they so interested in these top 20 people? And you know what? It's not always the people with the biggest influence and the biggest names and all that. It's the people who delivered the most value because I learned over two years of podcasting that there's two keys to having a really good episode, no matter who you are. If you're listening to this or watching this, if you want to understand, hey, I want to just crush it in the podcasting guest space. Here's the thing. Become an excellent storyteller. Really speak with emotion and conviction and energy in what you believe in. And the other thing is to deliver some actual tangible takeaway values. Because when you combine the storytelling with tangible takeaways that people are having to scribble their notes and they're, they're like, oh crap, I got to pause here and then get my phone out and, and keep those notes. If you can do those and combine that with storytelling and be entertaining and actually invest in your speaking skills, your communication skills, guess what? Those are the kind of episodes that get shared. Those are the kind of episodes that someone will listen to and go, oh my gosh, I've learned so much from this one episode. They didn't just talk about themselves. They didn't try to pitch their book the entire time. They didn't want to talk about their childbirth to, to you know, current time chronological order thing. It's like storytelling lesson takeaway, storytelling lesson takeaways in a very emotional conviction, take people on a journey. Those are the stories that people love and they'll tell their friends about it. Like, Hey guys, you probably don't listen to this podcast, but you need to hear this episode. Like this is, this is one of the best episodes I've heard. And I get that a lot. So I understand. Yeah. Some of the big names will definitely float to the top because people are searching for those names. And I hope that I do give the best interviews. I think I still give the best interviews, even of those big names. But the thing is the smaller ones, the people that are don't really have to have a big audience. They just have to have the big value because the listeners are going to determine if you gave them that or not. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So no, I think that's, I think that's priceless. And for me, what that shows is that, and we, well, we touched upon this during the weekend, the best entrepreneurs pay attention. The best entrepreneurs. And, and it's one thing that I tell people all the time, you know, they're saying, they, they ask about this, they ask about that. I said, I said, guys, I said, when I am speaking in a room like that night in the living room, I love that. I love that. You know, Roger's throwing me under the bus. I'm throwing Roger under the bus. And it's like, and we just met each other the day before. And it was just like immediate. It's like, okay, all right. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> right. And yeah. so, but the thing that was great is I said, guys, when I'm talking, I am, my mouth is moving and I am thoughtful about what I'm doing. That represents probably 3% of my attention. 97% of my attention is on what's happening in the room. Is this landing? Are people engaged? Are people distracted? Are people like literally looking at their watch? You know, are they, I mean, what's happening in the room? Dude, and it was on fire. It was on fire. It was Every, it, everyone that was speaking was so engaged. I mean, that was, it was, it was intense in that room. It, it I, was positively intense. It was, it was priceless. It was priceless. Yeah. Even, yeah. even after the, the pivotal moment of me spilling wine on, on Lawrence, <laughs> on Lawrence on our jeans, which disappeared, by the way. Red it wine disappeared. disappears on blue jeans, by the yeah, way. That, that, New knowledge. I would have never known that. I would have never known that. Well, now she, she's like, those are now her, she's told me, those are now her favorite jeans. She could always wear those. Any gig, doesn't matter. Anything gets spilling them, she'll be good. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, good stuff. It, it, was a, it was a really cool, serene moment because one, it's a beautiful setting. The house was gorgeous that we were renting out for that moment. And you know, everybody was excited. The buzz of the energy was the, it was the opening night of the, the main event day. And everybody knew that the big event was the next day. So as an appetizer, that was awesome. And, and also what I liked about that format is it gave everybody an opportunity to get to know each of you as a speaker and your personalities and what your expertise is so that they didn't want to miss anybody. You know, the people kept coming back. Like, you know, sometimes you go to these events and they give the agenda ahead of time, but people don't really know it, but they see the, the topic of discussion. They go, well, I don't really need to know about branding. So I'm just going to go hang out in my room and surf the internet. And then I'll come back when they are talking about sales or something, you know? So after they got to know you and, and saw the personality and the character and everybody was like, I'm not missing any speakers. And that's the way it should be. What I also noticed was this. There was a wonderful casual intimacy right out of the gate. We were, you know, that, that living room was packed with what, 35, 45 people who, you know, whatever, an hour prior, none of us had ever met or hung out. And 
but yet it was, they knew it was a safe space within which to ask anything, say anything, interact. And I, yeah, it was, it was great. And, and to me, I always, I always look at who, who made that space possible. I always looked, and that's why I give, I look to you and I say, you know, hats off to you and Lisa and, and your team, because that was a created environment. That was not, that wouldn't just have happened. You know, the interesting thing about that, my very first event was last October. We did that in Zion National Park in Utah, and we had 28 people attend that one. Very similar format, but you would think that it would be the same people that show up at each event, but only three people actually were at the second event that were at the first one. Awesome. So everyone that came in was new to me too. So I got to meet a lot of new people and, and there was a lot more women the second time because a lot of times these entrepreneurship events People think it's very alpha and it's very just aggressive and it's, it's kind of a turnoff to a lot of women. But I think after these women that saw the first event saw that, oh, there's actually some women attending these. There's wives and there's spouses and there's an entrepreneurs that are business owners that are women. Like maybe this is actually a pretty cool event for me to attend. And that was the feedback I got. I was like they had to see other people do it first. And then we saw we saw probably about 40 percent women at this this event, the ones you were at. So even the speakers, you know, we had different women and we tried to invite and speak the first event and they had different excuses for not doing it. But this one, you know, we had Lauren and, and Cynthia show up. So two hot rockets that know what their stuff is showed up. And that's amazing. Now, what was now, did you, what was your speaker split in terms of just male or female on the first one? Well, it was all, it was all men. We had six total of us speaking and uh, the two women that we invited just couldn't make it or just didn't have the time to do it. So yeah, it's, it's interesting how things like that can change. But you know, when you start to show that you're creating something like that, that's more inclusive, and it's friendly, and it's a safe place. And it's not just rah, rah, let's all go get tattoos and get drunk <laughs> tonight. You know, I mean, we don't, I don't want that kind of event. You know, if you're asking Lisa and I what our events are, we are making tax deductible vacations for entrepreneurs. Right. <laughs> that have impact. We, we love to travel. I mean, if you watch our Instagrams, we love to travel. We love to do an international, but things are kind of like restricted at the moment, but yeah. we, we like to travel. That's part of our lifestyle. And we said, you know what, why not just bring our own party, actually have some heartfelt takeaways, bring some amazing people that we want to connect with and also connect to our audience. And that's what we do is we make tax deductible vacations because let's face it, all business owners need vacations. They need some time away. A lot of times they can't justify the cost because they just think like, oh, if I'm leaving money and, I, and if I leave the you know, company, things are going to crumble. It's like, no, they work with us in the group. They learn how to manage a group externally. They don't have to be there if they're working with us the right way. And then they have enough money because they can just write it off as a business expense. This is a, it's a training thing. It's not a big vacation. But most of the conferences you and I both speak at, we speak at a lot. You go there and it's in a, usually in a cool city. That's the draw. Like, oh, come to the city. It's like really a cool city. And you get there and you sit your rear end on a seat for two days in a boring, stale conference room and eating crappy food. And then you don't have time to even look at the city. And then you're back out on the next flight. And it's like, why are we having this cool city if we never even got to explore it or use it as a tourist or even feel like we were visiting that city? We're just visiting a conference room that looks the same as any other hotel. And any. so me as a speaker, I was like, you know, if I'm going to have events, I only want cool backdrops because we're going to video this stuff. And I know that speakers really lack having good footage of them speaking and performing. So as a speaker, a little selfishly, I want cool backdrops. We had a beautiful lake in the backdrop of this one. Oh, the last one, we had a beautiful canyon in the background of the, of the speakers. So I try to think about where can we speak that's going to get the speakers want, you know, really motivated to want to be there because you're going to see this cool venue. And also as the audience, like, why would you want to look in a boring, stale conference room for, for two days sometimes and just drink crappy coffee and eat crappy food? And, and that's, that's terrible, but that's how most business conferences are. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. So I, no, I think this is, this is priceless. Let me, let me ask you, let me ask you. Um, so if you were to give, let's say your top three, recommendations like things that are probably overlooked or taken for granted with regard to building a community what would you advise someone to do i think the number one thing is you touched on it a little bit earlier about the ego 
kind of gets in your way. When you're trying to build a community, it's not about you. A lot of times people get really wrapped up in the Instagram life or they're just really obsessed with getting follower count so much that they're buying fake followers to look more relevant. And I don't know about you, but fake followers also pay in fake dollars. So I'm really not interested in having fake followers on any of my accounts. And I'm okay growing things organically by a value. And, you know, if people don't perceive the value that I'm creating good enough to follow me, then, then I need to work harder. I'm not doing the things that are really working or clicking or getting the message across. So I want to earn those followers rather than pay them. And I actually laugh at influencers that pay for that because they want to look relevant. It's like, that's so lame. So to me, it's like, you have to lose the mentality to trying to build followers. You got to build a community. And the difference I showed at a graph on that presentation is that unfortunately, well, maybe it's fortunate. Maybe it's good that so many people do this wrong because it makes it easier for me to do it right. They want to stand at the top of the pyramid. They want to be at the top of the mountain, holding their arms up. Like it's all about me and everybody below the mountains here to me. And they're here to watch what I say and do what I say and buy what I put out for sale. And that's all they really think about is themselves at the top of the heap. Yeah. I position myself at the bottom of the heap with an upside down mountain. So if you're listening to this or watching this, imagine a triangle like upside down, like literally an upside down mountain. I'm standing on the ground holding that thing up with my arms up. I still got my arms up, but I'm holding that community up. Well, that's well, me that, at the base. Well, that aligns that aligns to that that little analogy I used earlier in terms of like, yeah, you're the host and you're the and you're the bouncer and you're the, you're the guy, you're the guy who says, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I legitimately I do, I do that. Like on my Facebook group, there's three questions. The first one's like, do you agree not to spam or solicit in this group? The other one is, what is your email address for the, the newsletter and the things that we create in this group? And the other one is, you know, just a general question. But if they don't answer those questions, I don't even give them access to the group. And also I can see their profiles when they're applying to get in the group. And if they're from some country that's known for scamming or they have, or they're a member of 500 groups and they're just spammers. It's like, dude, I'm not letting these people out. I try to my best to curate who is going to fit in this culture, you know? And that's, that's the way I do is I try to cold, you know, like you said, literally the bouncer at the door of like, Nope, that's a fake ID. Like, Nope, you're not even using your profile photo. Sorry. My, my audience doesn't have conversations with kitty cats as a profile, which, you know, so you're not going to be in here. Well, there are other, top two your tower top three your the other number two and number three of of th things to look for or to really focus or dial in on with regard to building a community they have to have the reason to keep coming back they have to have the value proposition so if you're not getting any interesting content or learning things or even video content because a lot of things like for example the the content that you create david you're always making these really cool videos but it's not about you you're actually teaching things or you have a perspective that you're sharing in each of those things so if people are to watch every single one of your videos they're going to get a little bit of a takeaway or they're going to learn about a different perspective or something that's going to challenge a belief they have. So you got to make sure that you're creating content that people will read or click on. So if you're good at copywriting or creating video, use those skills. And if you don't have those skills, go hire someone that does have that skills to create that content for you. Because although it may be a free membership, they need to have a higher value perception than free, right? So if you're giving really good value and it's free, they're going to keep coming back. But if they're paying, if you're in a paid group and it sucks and there's no value, then they're not going to want to keep hanging out. So you always got to make sure the value proposition is a lot higher than the cost of entry. And unfortunately, I don't think people are doing that enough. They'll, they'll just basically create a group and hope that other people in the group just kind of take care of it for themselves. But that's not really being a leader, is it? You got to go in there and create the content. For the automotive side, I was writing how-to articles. I was teaching people how to drive their cars faster. I was doing product reviews. I was doing all kinds of stuff just to create content. But by me leading that charge, it started to inspire other people to want to also participate in those kind of activities. So then you start building these groups of people that are creating content because they see you do it and they go, hey, let's getting some good reaction. I want to build a name for myself. So I'm going to do this too. I'm going to do some how-tos. I'm going to get some sponsored parts. And I would see those people and go, hey, you know what? They're kind of a contributor to this group. Maybe I should make them staff. Maybe I should handpick the people that are actually contributing and creating that kind of stuff and make them part of my staff. It could be a 1099. It could be a barter exchange. It could be just something that they're trading their time for just being a part of it. You'll find a lot of people that want to build a community. They don't necessarily want to be a leader. They just want to be a contributor because they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So give them that avenue 
Otherwise somebody else will. And I see a lot of people failing at that because they think like, ah, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't need that. Or, you know, the ego kind of thing. Like I'm the only one that can do this. I can, I'm the only one that's about me. And they're constantly pitching to their group, but they don't let other people promote their stuff. It's like, it's kind of weird, you know? So how do you get people to keep coming back just a high value? And you got to create that. It's not going to create itself. But what I, but what I love that's consistent is that you're paying attention. You're being resourceful. You're not getting lazy. You're not laying back. You're, you don't, you don't have that little entitlement or complacency, you know, either little entitlement or little complacency. They're kind of cousins. And, you know, just like the idea of like, oh, okay, well I started it now, you know, it should kind of go on its own steam or something. No, nothing, nothing great goes on its own steam. No, you got to love those people out there thinking, am I not awesome enough? Why is this not working? Come on. <laughs> What'll be your third one? They'll be like that. You just don't see implemented or, or used well. Oh, this one's right up your alley. I think that people are too, they're, they're too aggressive about trying to monetize the community too soon. It's okay to build a community and make a money, make money from that passively or directly. But most people put the, the cart before the horse, right? To me, money has always been a result rather than any kind of business I build yeah, I want to make a profit, but that's not always the purpose behind what you should create. You always want to have a problem that you're solving or a solution to something that everybody gripes about or complains about. So for me, taking this example, 365 Driven as an entrepreneurship group, people want accountability. They want mentoring. They want coaching. They want a, a group of people that think and just really behave like them because we're kind of odd people. We're, we're not the normal of society. You know, if you're willing to take on higher the normal risks and, and make a living out of it and, and risk your entire life savings, sometimes you're, you're a different person than the average person that wants certainty and wants a steady paycheck. You just are. Yeah. And when you, when you hang out with people who aspire to be average, they're only going to validate average and they're going to look at you and go, are you sure you want to do that? They're just going to be naysayers and, and not really support what you do. So it's good to have the community of people that think and want to operate like you and understand that, you know, yeah, we're all kind of weird, but all weird people like to hang out together and we're going to get more successful and become better versions of ourselves. So don't monetize them too soon. Don't like go, Hey, I'm going to create this thing just to sell courses. You know, the, 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 the death is the 997 course that people want to just put out right away. Like, Oh, I want to create this course and sell it. And I'm going to build a community. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You got to build that community first. Yeah. They need to know you. You got to create a lot of free value, a lot of free information for at least a year, at least a yeah. year. If you, are you willing to do that? Okay. Let's go create a community. If you're yeah. not willing to do that, you're probably not going to do very well in this game because it's a, it's a really slow start to monetization. And then once you get the traction and you start to give that that loyal community and they're actually getting results and they know, like, and trust you, there's your branding, right? Mm -hmm. Then they start to open up their wallets potentially. And even then it might take seven to 10 times where they start to see results from other people because they're not early adopters and they go, well, I don't know. I don't want to be first. I don't know. And then they start to see other people talking about your book and your, your coaching services and the products or some things that you sell. And they go, well, damn it. These people that are just like me are getting results. So maybe now I'll, I'll make that purchase. So, I see a lot of people just fail at that. They want to start a community. The next day they're trying to sell t-shirts with the logo on it. It's like, why would someone wear your logo? Well, it's cool looking. Yeah. But they don't believe in anything behind that logo. Why would they wear that logo? It doesn't make any sense to them. It's like you're trying to sell bumper stickers that don't mean anything to the person putting it on their vehicle. Right. So they had to understand what the purpose is behind it, what it stands for, ask themselves the hard question. Does, do I stand for the same thing? And then they start to get the results and then they'll support it. They don't, they're not going to support it until they get the results from what they're learning from you. Totally. So, so here's, here's the last, the last um, thing that I'm curious just to bring it all together because, because here's the pieces that I see. And I'm curious in light of what you just covered. So you've got 365 driven, you have the Facebook group, you have like 3.8, you know, 3.8 thousand you know, members that are part of it. And you have that. You also have, the, those that are members who actually subscribe to, to the, the, the annual service. Mm -hmm. So what came, what came first, what came second, how, how did that work? Just so to help connect all those dots. Yeah. The 365 driven society is the paid group and it's, it's really a low ticket entry. It's $365 for an entire year. So literally a dollar a day. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is when I first pitched this to one of my business coaches, he was like, 
you sure you want to make a dollar a day group? That's like, you're not going to make any money in this. And what he didn't understand is lifetime value, right? So the dollar a day is really a differentiator to just take the cream of the crop out of the people who just talk a lot, right? Because let's be real. Anybody can afford $365 for a year. Anybody, like even if you're begging money on the street corner, you can probably make that in two days at some, at the right intersection. So I said, okay, but I build massive communities. I'm not trying to make maximum transaction value on individuals. Like some people like, oh, it's, you know, 365 a month or 365 a week, or, you know, there's all different multiples I could have done, but I was like, I want to build a community with millions of people. So why would I try to make a thousand plus on everybody that wants to be a part of this? Uh, so I built the free group first. It's about 3000 members at that time. Free, and I said, Hey, the free group being the Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We call that 365 driven entrepreneurs. Okay. So that group grew first. And then, uh, and then I started to have people asking me for more access right? Like, Hey, can we ask you questions? Can I pick your brain? All these kind of things. And I said, you know, what if I just make a group where they can ask those questions in the group and I'll be happy to answer that so they can get me access. It's not live. It's just on my time, my schedule, but I'll bring in and we'll do interviews. Like, so if I'm doing a podcast interview and my guest agrees to it, we'll do it live inside the group. And if there's time for that guest, we'll do some Q and a, but they won't get that unless they're in that paid group. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, a value add. And then sometimes we'll do live videos like this and we'll teach people things. And so it was a way just really to take that, that people that were really interactive and being participant in the group out of the, the major group and give them a little bit special privileges or behind the scenes kind of thing, behind the velvet rope type situation. And that's really worked pretty well. You know, it's just over 200 people in that group and I'm not growing it like crazy and running ads and stuff. Just people ask about it. They get value. They go, cool. And, and they get referred into that. So again, it's not about trying to make a maximum transaction because I know from just from that group, you know, if they make $365 purchase from me and they keep getting value from that, they're probably going to hire me from for a coaching perspective, which can pr approach six figures in a year. Or they're going to join my events or do things or just help me grow the, the, the movement. So you got to think of things in lifetime value to quit trying to just maximize transactions on one, one purchase. Right. Now there's the large group that's free. Yeah. There's a $365 group. That's the society. Right. And then I've got my mastermind groups, which are 8,000 a year. And those right. are eight people, eight people per group. Yep. And I've got the one-on-one -on -one coaching at the top of that. And then the live events as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so sequentially, so you, Facebook group was first, then the 365 a year, you only unveiled after a while. And then, then the events. Yeah. Yeah. And the coaching was always going on in the background. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. No, you're, you're, you're smart. You're practical. You're observant. What you apply is what I call street smarts. You know, you, you know, you got your feet in the ground, you're listening, you, you know, you're not, you're, you're not, you know, there are those that they're so blinded by, yeah, but it's a great idea. <laughs> Uh, I call it the beautiful baby syndrome. I'm like, look, I've seen better looking babies. <laughs> I'm, I'm the first one to say, it. I've seen better looking babies. Sorry. <laughs> well, even, even, the, even the weird context around that, right? You got people out there sitting in the sidelines that want to create some kind of influence strategy and branding, and they want to do what things like you and I are doing. Yeah. And they read a lot of books and they go to a lot of seminars, but they don't ever take actions because they're watching guys like you and me. And they're thinking like, I'm better looking than those guys. And I speak better than those guys. And they feel entitled to a response. They feel right. entitled to a reaction. So what do they do? They go create a podcast or they go try to write a book or they do five half-assed videos on LinkedIn and nobody's liking their stuff and nobody's buying their stuff. And they start to feel defeated because they're like, well, I'm better looking than them. And I sound better than them. Why isn't nobody listening to my stuff? It's because they have the wrong approach. They think it's about the money. It's like, dude, how long did you have to work for free on those content things before you started to see actual fruit of that labor? For me, the book, like for example, the book, it's been three years since my book came out. Number one bestseller on Amazon. Yeah. It took, it took just about two years to start seeing clients come to me just from that book. If the book was purely the lead gen and I always ask like, how did you find me? Were you referred? And Oh, I read your book. It took two years of it being a number one bestseller for that to actually start to happen. Otherwise, it was people that referred me, people that knew me, people that were in my network, people that followed me or saw the content. But that book and even the podcast is the same way. I've had a couple of clients that just came through from hearing the podcast, but 
that was probably 150 episodes in before that actually started to monetize. 100%. So can you put the work in and get the result later? If you can, go for it. If not, don't even start. Complete, complete. If you, if you can't, if you can't keep doing it, you know, just because you love the freaking journey, you know, I mean, I, 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 I hate using that because I see some people go, oh, it's all about passion and you just got to love the journey. And, and it's like, it's okay. And the, look, bullshit. Let's be real. You know, the bottom line is, is, you know, I like to win. I like to succeed. I do have an end game. You know, it's not the end of the game, but it's like, I do have a milestone that I want to achieve. But if I'm not digging the part, I mean, I love like one of my favorite parts and <laughs> I love, like, I love this. I love when I'm speaking to a prospect and they raise the stupidest objections that I could. Have. I love those. I have a ball because to me, that's like, oh, cool. It's like I'm sitting, it's like I'm playing, you know, tennis or racquetball with somebody. And I'm like, they just gave a really good one. I'm like, you son of a bitch. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got to ramp it up. It's like, and I'm like, good. You're making me think. You're making me hustle and sweat some more. And I love that. I mean, to me, that's a blast. And it's the yeah. same thing. That's why I love you just opened the floor when I was, when I was speaking in, in, in my town. You're like, okay, Q&A. And that thing went on and people just was like, boom, 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 boom. I think we did that for 35 minutes. And I, I am happiest. I am most comfortable. Give me no safety net. I am oh, the man. happiest there. And, and you know what? There's some props to my, my audience. They brought you some tough questions. They didn't just beat around the bush on the beginner level stuff. Like they brought it and you, you gave the answers. Yep. That really impressed me. Some of the questions that people were asking were exceptional. I was like, whoa, I'm learning here too. <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Well, as always, as always, you're a rock star. I appreciate it. I know that people are going to have value really looking at how to grow, how to, how to ramp up, grow, and, and support their community and serve their community. And thanks, my man. You are a rock star. Oh, and by the way, when I got back, this, this, was, this was a complete mind blow. When I got back, one of the people from my masterclass had shipped me this. This was stand, sitting outside my, 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 my office. It was like, they, 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 <laughs> they gave me this. Had I had this, I would have brought this out to Montana. Oh, man. Literally, but it's like, I mean, this sucker is made with studs and the whole deal. I was like, oh, give me a break. This is, too, this is out of control. That so, is hilarious. That, but, that's, but that's the kind of fun stuff of having community and serving people. So, all right, man. Well, as always, Rockstar, give my regards to Lisa and Anthony, and um, and we will connect up very, very soon, I am sure. We'll figure out some excuse yeah. to cause trouble someplace. There we go, man. Looking forward to it, dude.